All right. Uh, let's continue our foray into control today. Okay. Um, last time we talked about visual motor policies. <clears throat> Behavior cloning, in some sense, is the simplest way to think about control. It's also, you know, turning out to be pretty popular. <laughs> so um, it's funny because we had this conference on robot learning last week, and uh, everybody I've talked to who who went there, I only went for a day, but uh, you know, everybody who who I talked to that went there. Seems like there's a lot of alignment in the field right now around behavior cloning and foundation models, you know, for manipulation. That that seems like a pretty strong theme <coughs> right now. So I do think there's a lot of people excited about the behavior cloning kind of pipeline. There's a lot of people excited about. Re I'd say reinforcement learning is the other thing that a lot of people are excited about. So I want to make sure we not only talk about RL today, but I'll put them sort of side by side and help you understand, you know, what are the pros and cons. Um, what are they good for, right? So, all right, so in practice, we have our simulator, which we've been bundling up in our uh, you know, block diagrams that have, let's say, the EWA state coming out, the WSG state coming out, the cameras coming out. We're taking EWA commands. WSG command coming in. Okay, and our goal is somehow to come up with the other essential part of the policy, right, that takes all these things in and all together was, a, was creating a visual motor control policy that can ultimately feed all those back, right? <clears throat> and unlike Manipulator control. Was just um, focused on, let's say, Q robot. Here, we're trying to control the state of the robot and the state of the environment, right? state that I'm trying to control with my control system is bigger. It includes the objects in the world, the state of the peanut butter. You know, that's a much more general goal than what we did for manipulator control. So I think the big question is how do you design these controllers? Right, and it's visual motor basically because the cameras are there, right? And sometimes people will say visual tactile motor or there's, you know, depending on what sensors are coming in, but I'm trying to emphasize the, the fact that we're, we, we must use cameras, I think. Uh, for manipulation, it just makes such a big difference. Okay, so there's a whole spectrum of approaches. Behavior cloning is sort of one version, maybe the more traditional version which people today call model-based control, although that name is confusing, and you'll see why in a second here, okay? But would be to take that right-hand side, and we've got our EWA state, our cameras and everything coming in, and the first thing we'd do inside this diagram would be a bunch of perception in order to sort of estimate the state of the world. our sort of perception. Maybe you have a pose estimator. Maybe we make an oct tree for the objects we don't care about. You know, these are, uh, we don't want to manipulate, we just want to not run into. You know, the, a lot of the tools we've been talking about fit into sort of that box for perception. 
And then maybe you go through a planner, like our kinematic trajectory optimization or our sample-based planners. Okay, and then you run through our sort of classic manipulator control tools. This is a very standard sort of pipeline. It's been traditionally called the sense plan act pipeline. And it's still valuable for a lot of tasks today, okay? Um, but as we've been talking about, there's some strong assumptions here that you can summarize the state of the world in a way that is sort of amenable to use our, our multi-body planning tools, okay? BC is the other extreme, right, where our behavior cloning is with which I want you to think about that as supervised learning, supervised sequence learning. Because it might take a history of observations to predict the next action. It's not just from an immediate map from the current observation to the action. It might be a history of observations, okay? But that's the, you know, I'm gonna put the whole thing from the camera and the EWA to the EWA commands in a big neural network, right? And it's powerful and it's um, scalable, okay? But it does depend on, um, you know, collecting a large number of demonstrations. You get to use cool haptic teleop interfaces, right? So it's kind of fun to do that. But, um, <clears throat> you know, the promise of doing this is that it gets rid of some of the strong assumptions that we make here. Oh, yeah. How big is many? So um, for, the, for the single skill tasks that I showed you last time, rolling dough or whatever, um, it's gone down, but it's like, let's say 50 to 100 is the standard answer. 50 for a single arm, 100, maybe if you're doing double arm by manual. So, but the, the goal going forward is to you know, build the foundation model and then we don't know how many is and it could be a lot. Okay. So people are very worried. I think, well, people have different opinions about whether human demonstrations alone can scale to the, to the big goal. Yeah, but the promise here is that the learning that's happening inside just to predict the, you know, the next action, if you will, is going to learn something essential about that's, that's, you know, a latent state representation that is not constrained by our imagination, let's say. It's whatever that represent, internal representation needs to be in order to predict this. And that it could potentially do something more powerful than our, than our more structured pipeline. Reinforcement learning lies somewhere in the middle, okay? So we're gonna often make use of some models, but we're also gonna try to avoid some of this structure in, in position in the middle, okay? And it's gonna be, give, it's gonna require less supervision, okay? Um, but it's also gonna be a harder optimization problem. So, but if I send one message by the end of the lecture today, I want you to, to think that these things are actually more similar than they are different. So a lot of people ask me these days, like, well, should we be doing BC or RL or model-based? You know, and I don't think it's an exclusive or in any sense. These things, I think when we really understand them, um, they're actually very, very similar. The representations that you would expect to get out of this, you know, could be achieved with a better, you know, sort of planning infrastructure. They certainly could be achieved from RL. RL, like we've said before, 
actually often uses behavior cloning in the last steps of the pipeline in order to transition from state feedback to camera feedback. So there's a lot of connections back and forth. Okay, so um, remember when we said we were gonna write this neural network, okay, the, the policy, if you will, was parameterized by, let's say, the parameters of my, this is my neural network parameters. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, in the simplest form, I wanna have the EWA command coming out. I thrash a little bit whether I, I wanna say that the command is U in, in my mind, but the, normally the output of a system is Y, so you have to pick, but I'll just say that the, the command of the robot is like this, okay, and it's a function of the observations coming in, maybe the previous action, the previous observations, and some, some finite history of observations. So these are like the weights and biases of the network, of the transformer, whatever it is, okay? So the big question is how do you get those parameters? The <coughs> behavior cloning pipeline requires explicit labels saying, given this camera image or this history of, of images, this is exactly the action you should have taken, okay? And as a result, um, you know, we have to give, we have to work hard to give our demonstrations, but we have a relatively easy learning problem, okay? Reinforcement learning is gonna try to give a uh, weaker s demonstration signal and try to solve a harder optimization problem. So let's just write that down. The standard picture you always see in RL, well, I'm gonna call it a plant, okay? And the controller, it's the policy policy we're still calling pi, okay? People call this the robot or environment or whatever, but you always see this loop. The output of the plant is, I tend to call it y, right? These are my observations. So this is my u. This is because I started in controls, right? I think in RL it's more common to call this the observations and this the actions. Okay, but just a, a, a personal choice about which, what you want to call that, okay? And the policy, just like we did um, in the behavior cloning case, it's exactly the same thing. We're gonna choose some parameterization of our policy here, and we're gonna try to optimize the parameters alpha, okay? Given one more thing, given our reward function, scalar reward function. It's a, I'll even say it's a scalar one step reward function. Okay, and in this I am uh, conforming Normally I would call that a cost function, but I'm gonna say reward today and do my best. If I accidentally say cost, that's my, my bad. That's just habits that die hard. Okay, so then we're gonna to try to maximize over alpha um, the rewards over time. And I think many people have seen this much of RL to sort of know what's happening here, okay? But <clears throat> let, me ma let me make sure our syntax and our understanding is sort of consistent here. also need somewhere here we need we need to define what x0 is okay this is a perfectly well defined problem i guess i'll just peel that check 
So you put me in some initial condition. Okay. I'm going to now execute this. Let's recognize this to, as the equations of the plant. Right, this is the dynamics of my plant. This is my controller, my policy. Together, it's a system that I can simulate, right? Yeah? Uh, you can do do that, but I think it's it's actually it's much better to write up like this. Yeah, so you could you could implement it on the real system. Your reward function can some can get used privilege information if you like. But you're stuck in simulation if you do. Yeah. Good. So I mean, we can ask that question even in the supervised learning case. So, um, so the simplest answer would be yes. You just start over. If you uh, if you got a new robot, we're we need different weights for the the, the policies uh, for for the policy. So we're going to get collect new data and treat the actions as a completely different story, right? The foundation model version of this is maybe you learn a massive enough neural network that possibly the same policy, if it was conditioned on something about the robot, could actually do all the tasks. I, we, I don't. We've seen a little bit of this. This is people call this cross embodiment, for instance. Okay, we've seen the beginnings of sort of uh, of that, and certainly we've seen people that are collecting data sets together. But um, but I think that's still a little optimistic. I don't know. I would say the major reason to do that would be because we can get more data, and we can all share our data, even though there was generated on different robots. But um, I mean, natural intelligence didn't crack that, I guess. Yes? I've written the comp completely deterministic version first, and I'm going to generalize it to the stochastic version second. Yeah? Yeah. So this is completely deterministic, but it's something I can, I can take the initial conditions of my simulation, right? And I can step forward my simulation. I can uh, evaluate the outputs, right? This is actually the equations of motion of my multi-body plant. Right? This is actually just the, the evaluating the neural network. Yeah, so exactly the right question. So it, aren't, we t aren't we normally talking in RL about, about uh, probabilities, right? So you can generalize this, a more general version. So let, let's first just recognize that this is, is a general optimal control formulation. There are many tools to solve it. RL is sort of one approach. I'd say it's a subset of optimal control, which emphasizes a few things, stochasticity certainly being one of them. But um, you see this is my OC, yeah? Optimal control. RL is a subset of optimal control. Which emphasizes trying to solve that problem with trial and error, right? It emphasizes solvers that only require black box solutions. I'll try to, I'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. You've already, if you started the problem set, you already know a little bit about what that means. Black box optimization, I think stochastic updates. And uh, these days, neural nets. Okay, but there's actually an entire world. If you just say this, I mean, actually we spend a lot of time in under actuated so thinking about many different ways to solve this. I guess if F and G are linear systems, for instance, like we can just write down the solution, right, in most cases. Uh, even in some cases where they're nonlinear systems, we actually have almost closed forms solutions for some of these or algorithms that are guaranteed to 
do a finite amount of computation and give you really good controllers. Okay. RL is um, much more about F and G can be arbitrary, okay? But my access to them is also uh, very, very weak. All I need to be able to do is, is to evaluate F and G, okay? Uh, but some of the other tools that, that have much stronger algorithms and much stronger results require F and G to have some structure or to require you to have gradients of F or G available. So RL is the sort of the assumes the least possible about your, your, your system, about your problem, and has very general tools, but they're, they're weaker tools in the sense that they require many more evaluations and have less guarantees about success. Okay, when you, dis when you switch to stochasticity, the ver you might write a, this a little bit differently. You, you might say, I almost wrote min there, see? Max over alpha of the expected value of the sum over rewards. Okay, and then each one of these has a prob probabilistic equivalent. You might say that the, I have a distribution over possible next states that is conditioned on the current states. Okay, I have a probability distribution over observations that is conditioned on um, the current state, the current action. And then this can, let's leave this um, deterministic for a minute, but we can make even the policy stochastic. And then I can have a probability distribution over x naught. Okay. But when you see these things, I want you to I wanted to first write this because this I think seems like exactly what you would expect if you were to look at the way, let's say, Drake does simulation. It evaluates the multibody equations, it figures out what the next positions and velocity should be, it, it does its update, right? Everything is very clean. It looks a little bit more messy, at least in my mind, to write like this, okay? It's not as computational immediately. You have to draw samples from this and think about what it is, okay? But it, it represents exactly the same things. Yeah? You're saying, can it, could this one? If you just put this into a mathematical program, what happens? Yeah, I mean that's that's roughly what we've been doing with trajectory optimization. If we just if we if we were to make this a polynomial, for instance, then those are exactly the kind of problems that we were solving in kinematic trajectory optimization. Right, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. So so okay. So what if you were to change this into a, a neural network and then just still hand it to mathematical problems? So I think the number of parameters in the neural network would probably kill you, and just like snopped would fall over and cry probably, but. Um, but does the, uh, does the approach generalize, right? I mean, in neural networks, people have tried doing higher order optimization in neural networks, but the dominant one is first order optimization. So if you take a solver in mathematical program and do first order optimization, then you're roughly doing exact gradient descent on these problems. The, so, and, and that's one of the things that we'll actually compare against at some point here, but, um, but it, is, and it seems very different to then to not do that, to not, to not call mathematical programs. Uh, and there are some reasons to, to prefer to not do it, actually. There's reasons where even though it takes longer to do black box algorithms on this, they can be more robust uh, if you have discontinuous landscapes and stuff. Okay, but is the setup clear? The high level sort of setup? All right, so this is my, my robot dynamics. This is my policy. I've got some distribution over initial conditions. I have, I, I typically keep the reward function as being known and deterministic. Some people would make that as a stochastic thing too, but I don't know why you'd want to have a, a random reward function. Um, and then the objective is now, you know, now that these are random variables, the reward even is a random variable, now you have to take an expectation over all the randomness. Okay. This is a harder problem than the behavior cloning problem, right? Why is this a harder problem than behavior cloning? Right? 
I, and I tried to emphasize that this is doing supervised learning and reinforcement learning. I think people sort of know that reinforcement learning is harder than supervised learning. But why is it? And the, the equations don't look that different. Right? The difference is that, and maybe the simplest way to see the difference, is that um, this picture here of having a bunch of input-output data that tells me when I'm in this, when I've had this history of observations, I should take this command. It completely severs this loop, right? I don't have to think about my plant at all in order to, to solve the, the BC problem, right? I'm just saying, someone has told me, you know, I have a stream of inputs, I want a stream of outputs. It completely severs it. To do BC well, you have to start thinking about stability and, and other things, okay? But, but the actual op, the learner is completely severed. And for every set of, imp, of history of observations, you, you, it, someone tells you exactly what the immediate action should be. In the reinforcement learning setting, you have a, a, a reward function. You can only determine the total cost depends on a, on a feedback through a feedback connection through the world and in that formulation the the, the right answer is you might it might actually take you many times uh, many time steps to understand the consequences of your action right there's a sort of standard problem of delayed reward The action taken at time, let's say, two, might impact cost right? You have to wait and reason about over the consequences of your actions over a long time. Okay, so RL is going to be a weak, uh, a harder algorithm to solve, and we're going to have slightly weaker algorithms. Okay, let me, since, we, since I wrote it in this way, I want to just take a second and say one more thing sort of to connect all these dots, right? When I write the policy like this as a history of observations, it seems, uh, you know, that, that's not sort of fundamental. And I think people, especially in the, um, in the ML community, sort of, I think, thrash back and forth between different representations uh, but I think from a controls perspective, it's, they're, very, uh, they're all very connected in our room. So um, a quick aside. Let's think about parameterizing dynamic policies here. Okay, even if I just want to have linear controllers, okay? If you want to write a linear... Um, if you want to write a linear dynamical system, then the two canonical choices would be to write something in this kind of a form, Or to write something in this form. Okay. This is called the state space form. is called an ARX form, autoregressive with exogenous inputs. Let's just call it ARX, yeah. Or autoregressive. Okay? When you have <clears throat> as soon as they're auto as soon as you're autoregressive, okay, you the the act, the thing you output comes back into the thing that your um, is your input. 
then they have the same types of representational power. You can pretty much go back and forth between these two. For instance, if you wanted to take an ARX model and write it in state space form, then just to take that truncated history of observations and call that your state. Okay, and you can put that in into this form. You could always write those equations in this form, and similarly, you can always go that way. Okay. So, <coughs> um, you know, multi-body plant, for instance, I already wrote it in this form, right? In fact, almost all the systems we've written in Drake, we write in these sort of state space forms. When you write a recurrent neural network, like an LSTM, for instance, that's a state space form, right? You can make those nonlinear equations, okay? But the recurrent units are a state space form. GPT, right, some big transformer that takes a long history of observations, that's in an autoregressive form. And the behavior cloning we did so far, you know, their diffusion policy, for instance, these days, it uses the ARX form. Okay. Now they're more efficient, you know. So, so it's you know you you can watch the community sort of go back and forth. Like um, people were doing a lot of LSTM work in the field, right? And then attention is all you need, and suddenly we went to to transformers that were doing ARX models, and now people are like, oh, it kind of stinks that you have a, a, a total you know, observation window of, of 40,000 or whatever. So let's do recurrent networks again. Right? And, it, and I just feel like the conversation is, is slightly corrupted because, I don't know, we just need to think a little bit a little more like a sort of a state space versus ARX form, and then things become pretty clear. If you were, someone asked me the other day about, right, right after the behavior cloning class, like. Have we seen examples of things like the fusion policy having really long history, right? Doing partial observations. So imagine if you were to like have a task where you had to put like, I don't know, a key in a drawer and then close the drawer and then come back and you know, do something else and then come back and open the drawer to get the key. That seems like you'd need a really long history of observations to remember that. So that's a case where having a state space form, for instance, can be a lot more efficient or you allow yourself to have a really long tape and you do attention. You, know, you, you use a transformer or some sort of architecture to try to make that really long tape more efficient. Does that make sense? Okay. But these are just, they're, they're just a, mo a, a modeling choice that you parameterize things slightly differently, but they're mostly interchangeable. Yeah? Okay, so in RL um, or, in, or in the behavior cloning, you can pick either one of those forms and people, people pick both, right? You can certainly do behavior cloning with RNNs, you can do behavior cloning with transformers. Um, that's a, that modeling choice is almost orthogonal to the algorithms, apart from their sort of efficiency. Okay, so um, you know, the new recipe here for RL is basically step one, instead of, in, you know, where the, the visual motor sort of behavior cloning policy was just give a lot of demonstrations, the recipe today is, first step in practice is to make a simulator, okay? So the, set, the tasks that RL is working best for are different maybe than the tasks that BC is working best for. I emphasized in the BC lecture that we tried to do tasks that were really hard to simulate, okay? If you do have the ability to write a good simulator, then, you know, reinforcement learning becomes a lot more promising. Then you have to write a good cost function, okay? This can be surprisingly hard, okay? The, well, I think in the, if you could solve optimal control problems perfectly, then you would imagine that very simple cost functions maybe could capture a lot of the problem. But in practice, our optimizers are a little bit weak, and you end up doing a little bit of guidance. Uh, you know, there's some elbow grease required in writing a good cost function for non-trivial reasons. Okay, and then you do something like the deep RL to to close the gap. Yeah. Um, the dream maybe is to handle 
uh, bad cost functions, okay? But I think the practice is that you end up having to do some elbow grease in the, uh, in the cost function writing. And for, um, let's see. When we're making the robot load the dishwasher, a natural objective would be I would like the mugs to be in the top drawer. I would like the plates to be in the bottom drawer. Okay. But if you just write that, there's no reason why the policy doesn't, I don't know, throw the mug and have it land in the top drawer or, okay. So it's actually very subtle to write. Um, Leslie Kelbling likes to call it background utility, right? That there's a lot of implied knowledge that comes sort of from common sense that it's easy to forget to write in a cost function. Okay? And your optimizer will exploit that. It will find things. I will show you examples today where a simple cost function led to ridiculous results. Okay? Uh, because there's basic things like, you know, don't use too much you know, high energy physics in, in your plate manipulation, right? Uh, uh, things like this. Okay? Now language models can potentially bring in some of that common sense, and that's one of the things that people have been doing a lot now is trying to, to combine LLMs uh, with, with sort of cost function writing. All right, so this was actually one of the, the maybe early big success stories of putting a dexterous hand in a simulator, you know, having the, the cube in there, doing lots of trials with a reinforcement learning algorithm and simulation, and then showing it working back on the real robot. Okay, and there's a lot, been a lot of excitement around RL, of course, I mean, people know about uh, AlphaGo and AlphaZero and, uh, and the lineage of Atari games, the incre increasingly complicated uh, uh, multiplayer games and the like, okay? Um, I would say in robotics, it's been a few, there's been a few key demonstrations that really changed people's perspective. Uh, I would say this, I would point to this one most strongly in the last couple of years uh, when Marco Hooter and, and company at ETH showed that training a quadruped in simulation could result in uh, impressive, you know, not jittery, you know, like beautiful behavior on real terrain in the real world. I think this was a defining moment for the field. People really took notice. Even like the Boston Dynamics of the world that we had extremely good model-based control said, well, that actually looks pretty good. There's a few things I saw in there that maybe would have been hard to write with our traditional pipelines. And I think a lot of people took it more seriously after that. Okay, um, this is a local example. So, uh, so the OpenAI was a kind of an initial you know, flipping, moving cubes around, and then they did a Rubik's cube actually. Um, but it was always it was heavily instrumented, and it was always in the simple case in some sense where the the object was in the hand. It didn't have it didn't have to worry about it falling out of the hand very much. Uh, so Poolkit and, and Tao Chen uh, here have shown that they can extend that kind of work to, a, to unknown objects, first of all, less sensors, and also the sort of up, upside down configuration, which is much, much harder. But again, this pipeline was trained in simulation. It uses um, primarily the depth channel of the, of the, of the sensor, and, and it, you know, trained in simulation works in the real world. This is, this is, I just couldn't help but put this in. So people think I'm against RL, but I'm not actually. And I, this is my thesis work a long time ago, okay. Um, this was a, a little passive, that one's not learning, okay. But that's a little physics toy of passive dynamic walker, okay. And my thesis was actually reinforcement learning. It was um, learning to walk. This was the little robot that started off with a passive dynamic walker and then learned how to walk by itself. So it, Started off, didn't need to learn much because it was built cleverly, I guess, it built like that other toy on the ramp, but then the treadmill slowly went down and it just kept walking. Back in the day, yeah? But you know, the funny thing is, I spent so much time trying to convince people why they should think about RL, and they're like, oh, RL's never gonna work. And now I, I have to convince people that there's things other than RL out in the world. I think my timing is just really bad. It was a cute little robot. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so I think the the high level uh, message in terms of like what you should, whether you should use RL, I've, I slightly I warned people who were trying to do RL for their project that it um, 
I think you can do amazing things with RL, but um, it requires a lot of compute. That's one possible concern. And it's um, sort of not guaranteed to work. You know, it will almost always work, but it requires a lot of elbow grease. So I would say my some high, a few high-level messages here. I believe, I believe you can make a lot of things work with RL. I would consider myself a believer. But I think it's based on a bunch of things, right? It's based on some really good software. Just like the deep learning revolution was partly powered by GPUs and PyTorch and, and the like, I think we've seen a similar um, you know, set of consolidation in software that happened in RL that made it really start working well. Um, I really do think if you can sim, can write a simulation, and you add the elbow grease, possibly cost function tuning, and that's not to be underestimated, I think, okay, then really most things can work. Most problems can be solved with RL. Which is a, a strong statement. I wouldn't have said that maybe a few years ago, but we've gotten to the point where it really is uh, impressive. I think most things could fall if you just hammer on it enough. I don't actually do that much RL work in my lab, okay? So um, we do some theory of RL, I would say. But the RL practice is, um, I don't, 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 don't do as much RL practice. I, not because I don't believe it will work, but just because I don't find as much clarity in thinking about the way it works. Yeah. So by it can be both. It can be both, although less hyperparameter. I mean, so um, certainly the people who are doing it uh, for a profession also know how to do the hyperparameter tuning, but I think a lot of people get pretty far with out-of-the-box PPO implementation in, in the stable baselines type solution. Uh, you get pretty far before you have to hyperparameter tune. I think cost function tuning happens almost right out of the box. Uh, and it's partly about this background utility idea that it's hard to write a good cost function that the ex optimizer won't exploit. But it's also, I think, um, the more subtle thing is that you can make the problem easier or harder, right? If, you, if, if your objective function, if your reward function is, you know, don't die, right? Uh, then, you know, like, it's the, the number of years robot lives or something like this. And that's going to take a lot of compute to sort of back that up into immediate actions, consequences of your actions. If it is, I, you know, I like to move in this direction and then in this direction, then that's a simpler cost function to optimize because it has less delayed reward. And so some of the cost function tuning is about reward shaping so that you can get more immediate uh, you know, better grant. It just kind of helps the algorithm out. And it's, it's, I really want to say it's not RL versus BC versus models. They're all pretty related and pretty simple, similar. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the RL software that's really made a big difference. Okay. Um, how many people have heard of OpenAI Jim? How many people have run OpenAI Gym, have used it? Awesome, okay. So um, OpenAI Gym, this is now Gymnasium. Everybody's, well, people talk about uh, porting. Okay, OpenAI said we're not gonna support OpenAI Gym. They, they got the whole world to use it and then they said we're gonna drop that. Um, but it's now been picked up in a different project called Gymnasium. It has a very basically similar interface. All of us are supposed to port our code from Gym to Gymnasium. Many of us haven't, I don't know why people aren't porting, like uh, there's still a lot of people that just sort of didn't do the work to port their code. But um, yeah, it's a very, very simple interface, okay? So you say, I've got a RL problem, I'm gonna define the, the constructor, okay? And then I'm gonna define what it means to take a step, what it means to reset, what it means to render, and close, okay? This is not, uh, very different, I mean, it, it is very different, I guess, but it's, I want you to see, it's almost exactly what we've been doing this whole semester, right? So we have like the diagram builder, we have the simulator advanced too, we have the create default context, 
okay, and publish. And there's pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping between these. Well, at least in this direction, there's a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, <coughs> but I do think that the, the philosophies of these are very, very different, right? So let's. So Jim has uh, no notion of context, right? Maybe I'll just. Jim doesn't have any notion of context. Drake does have this notion of context. All of you hated it in the first week, but hopefully you're okay with it now, okay? And um, you know the thing that you lose from that is there's no sort of introspection. No deterministic playback. Logging is, is, is a, you know, you can log the stochastic thing, okay, but it's, you can't just like reset to that in the middle and, and play out a deterministic rollout, right? So they're very different philosophies. That calling out the context explicitly was a little bit to grok in the beginning, but it does give you powerful tools. Yeah? Um, <coughs> Jim is, is, can I say it's floats only? Does that make sense, right? This, this is what I'm saying about it being black box. So if you've, once you've got your reinforcement learning problem specified in the gym format, then um, you can, you can uh, step it, step it, step it. You can see what the observations were. But for instance, you cannot get the gradients of the, observa of the observations or the gradients of your dynamics, right? So there's no auto diff, no symbolic. All these extra tools that we try to, to build, um, you know, there's no access to multi-body equations, multi-body quantities, let's say. So, for instance, Jacobians, you know, inverse all the inverse dynamics, careful cancellations we did, for instance. But you can model anything. All right, so this is just, the, it's not, I'm not trying, it makes it sound like I'm saying that this is all bad and this is good, but it's, I don't actually mean that. I think they're just different philosophies, right? So um, Drake is trying hard to do, to put structure in the dynamics, to expose that structure. So you can, you can dig in, you can ask for gradients, you can ask for symbolic. You can ask for Jacobians, you can do structured optimization, structured debugging, all these other things, okay? But then it's, um, it's, it's not the best tool for, I don't know, Go or something, right? Or, or pharmaceuticals or whatever, okay? Um, the RL gym can model anything. It, there's no, there's not absolutely no requirements to sort of be here except for the you when someone says step, you change your internal state, however it's represented. You don't even have to declare your state, okay? So these are very philosophically different. It's easy if you have a Drake simulation to publish that, it's easy if you have any simulation, but certainly if you have a Drake simulation, it's easy to act like a gym interface, okay? But the gym interface doesn't express everything that we ask you to express in, in Drake. So the RL philosophy, I would say, is that you should be a black box. Make no assumptions about what's going on inside the environment, right? And the Drake philosophy tries to be a glass box, if you will. That you can see everything you have complete clarity about you know, what's, what's inside, and uh, hopefully you can use that to your advantage to write stronger algorithms. But they're going to be more focused, typically. Okay, so the gym is one massive. I can't, I can't um, 
overstate how important it was that the field sort of agreed on a standard. I think its simplicity was, was essential to its adoption. People started publishing uh, you know, benchmark problems against this. Everybody started, you know, and it just meant to a, a major consolidation of the field. It used to be that we didn't really compare our algorithms against each other, each, every, everybody's benchmarks in the same way that we do now. Um, <coughs> so the, the way, if you do have a Drake simulation and you want to act like a gym, then it's pretty easy to do that. You just basically, you can just send your simulator into, it's really hard to read the pie. That's a, that's a messy thing there, okay, but uh, this is just in the pie. It's easier if I scroll down, okay, but basically you pass in into your init function, your simulator, your time step, which port is your actions, for instance, which port is your observations. You can have a port for the reward or you can write a reward function, okay, and, uh, and it closes that gap and just acts like a, a gym interface. Okay, so Jim is the one is the first big thing that happened. I think that made this the software mature. Okay, second one is um, algorithms that sort of uh, started getting mature implementations. Okay, so this is stable baselines three, which I think is kind of winning. Right, it used to be much more mixed. Stable baselines three is the collection of our RL algorithms. And there's a lot of different algorithms, okay, implemented here, for instance. But I would say, uh, even though there are a lot of choices, the world has sort of consolidated, I would say. Uh, I would say most people who are doing RL in simulation these days are use CPO, right? If you have RL on a real system without simulation, that's possible. Of course, you can have your real robot provide that um, gym-like interface, okay? You can, every experiment is just moving the real robot. Then <clears throat> some people will still use PPO, but I think the choices tend to favor um, off-policy RL, which we'll talk about in a future lecture. Things like QT opt or SAC, for instance, I think is on this list here. Yeah. Okay. So that's the second big thing, which was, of course, enabled by the gym existing. Okay. These days, it's pretty rare for people to write their own um, algorithm. In fact, right as the story goes, uh, PPO. The, if you open up the paper for PPO. Then, and you type in the algorithm, then your success will be less than if you just use the existing algorithms, right? And there's people that have written papers saying, like, here's the, you know, 28 tricks to PPO, and if you really want PPO to work, use this SHA in this repo, and the parameters, all the magic numbers that were used there. So um, I think it really does, like, people have consolidated and, and made a couple really good implementations and we've all built tall towers on top of them. So uh, it does help to have everybody con converging. Yeah? I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah. And, and some people do hyperparameter tune PPO in order you know, even for their for their tasks, but I think the you get pretty far with out of the uh, out of the box PPO algorithms, right? Um, yeah, if someone were to adversarially choose a, pr a problem that would be bad for PPO, then maybe you have to to mess around a little bit. The simulators also enabled this too, right? So. Um, so I would say that, so most, so Drake is not the best simulator for RL, 
when it was, it was um, you know, when we started Drake, we sort of focused on making the, the sim to real gap small, focused on trying to get high quality simulations of real robots. And Isaac, for instance, is the NVIDIA simulator. They focused on massive scale and less on, on accuracy. So I'd say most people who are doing RL are doing it in, for instance, um, Isaac, where you can put uh, 1,000, 10,000 quadrupeds into a single instant, uh, it's on a single GPU and simulate them all simultaneously. And Drake it does not support GPU uh, for that, for those rollouts yet. Nowadays, the people actually are trying to care, care more about uh, getting RL things to work on the real world. A, a common pipeline we've seen is that they'll, people will train from nothing to something in Isaac and then do a second round of training, for instance, in, in Drake in order to close the sim to real gap. So that's kind of the, the place in the ecosystem we're holding on to. Yeah. yeah, PPO has really become the default RL algorithm, I think, for a lot of these cases. Okay, any questions that sort of at the high level? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so as you said PPO is relying on a high number of environments. So um, you mean like the domain randomization that you see in there, is that what you mean? I see. So you can definitely do um, domain randomization in Drake too. So I think you can, everything you can do in Isaac you can do in Drake. It's just you can't do 10,000 parallel, right? So it's more, it's just amount of simulation speed. So you would, we, would, uh, we would try to do the same domain. I mean, sometimes in the last stages you would do less domain randomization. That's possible, but that's not even, a, that's not a requirement. I'd say keep the same demand, domain randomization, uh, but just expect your simulations to run more serially I mean, even in, in Isaac, when you turn on rendering, things slow down a lot, right? There's a lot, of, there's a lot of things that make that workflow work, which you then over, have to eventually overcome in order to, to get it to work on the real system. Good question, yeah. Um, it has a unity like, oh, you, so yeah, certainly Omniverse is a, is, has got a much bigger GUI ecosystem, right? So if you want to like go straight, straight from CAD into, into this, then certainly that they have a lot more developer tools like that. Yeah. Yeah, could be. Yeah. It's one of the, one of the usability things. Yeah, we, I mean, we definitely haven't tried to write GUIs for, for Drake in the past. Yeah. But you can use Omniverse's GUI and then send in Drake. Um, Okay, so let's dig in a little bit about, um, and I'm not gonna do the full PPO derivation, I want you to, uh, to have a high level understanding of how it works and where you should expect it to work, okay? Maybe I'll do it over here. Oh, I forgot to show you. No, I, I spent my whole morning playing with this thing. Okay, so I, I, I did this, right? I went through the, the pipeline and uh, made my sort of cheese it box. Remember the example of the force control in the cheese it box? So I took that problem and just did the quick Drake gym environment around there. And this is what PPO did. Okay, so it did. So my cost function was to flip up the box. I didn't actually say don't smack your head repeatedly into the wall for the rest of time. That's the background utility problem, okay? But, um, you know, that's maybe my bad. I guess I didn't say don't do that. But it does solve the problem. I would say the other solution is more elegant. Um, but to be able to just put that in and have it like, you know, spend an hour or something to, to optimize it and. Pretty good. I actually was training it on this laptop just before to see if anything good came out of it here. Let's just see what happens. It's super simple code, right? Um, uh, 
Uh, not so good. Yeah, that's actually not very good. Okay. Yeah, okay. Bad luck. Shouldn't have retrained it right there. Okay, but yeah, so I mean, uh, it really does work. It's not that hard to just do the wrapper, let it run for a while, um, and, and, and get a result out. The, hour, the, uh, you know, the architecture I used was like straight up basically the default network architecture from stable baseline, so I didn't do any hyperparameter tuning. I didn't actually also have a great result, but I think most people don't do that much hyperparameter tuning, and uh, it works pretty darn well. I sent the inverse, I still use the inverse dynamics controller, so on the box, you know, I actually, I actually moved some of the manipulator control stuff into the simulator side of the box. Why not let the action space be the, um, you know, the, the controller I know how to write at the low level, right? And then I gave it actually state observations in that case, but I have a version that just does, uh, you know, key points or does image-based observations too. And it's just, uh, you take the diagram, boom, and then you just say, I just exported my observations port, and I made a rewar little reward system, and I, I can put those two tools together. The cost function was a nightmare, right? Like, so this is, I said, I want the thing to be vertical, right? So the box angle, but then it started using incredible high velocities, so I put a term in to, do, to make the box velocity less. I tried to minimize finger effort just because it was going crazy. Um, and then here's the funniest one, right? I realized I had to add 10 to all the rewards. You see why? Because, because otherwise it was actually rewarded for crashing the simulator, right? Like actually causing the simulator to pr end prematurely. Uh, you know, I, it's because I used cost instead of reward, right? So um, yeah, if you could actually get less cost by terminating early by crashing the simulator. So it was an extremely good algorithm for finding, to make multi-body plant crash until I added 10. Okay, that's the game, um, right? Okay, so let's think about the optimization problem that's being solved. And it's a subtle op optimization problem because <clears throat> it's happening in this alpha space, right? In the, in the parameters of the policy, which is a hard place to, to think about. But the algorithms are easy to think about in, a, in simpler landscapes, okay? So in our traditional optimization landscape, right, if I have these are my parameters alpha, let's say. This is my f of alpha, and I want to say minimize over alpha, f of alpha. In the past, we've done constraints, right? <clears throat> then the traditional way we've done this has been with gradient-based optimization, right? So SNOPT, for instance, does this. It uses partial f, partial alpha. It uses partial G, partial alpha, partial alpha, to do second order gradient optimization. Right, so it computes the gradient there, estimates from, from a few gradients a quadratic objective, jumps directly to here, makes the update, and sort of rapidly converges to a local minima. That's the picture we've always had. So what's happening in the RL landscape? We're not allowed to use partial f, partial alpha, partial f, partial g. That's been, uh, you know, by virtue of being general, we've given up the ability to ask for gradients. It's, a, it's actually been a, a, an active conversation in the literature the, the last few years is, if you do have those gradients, should you use them, yes or no, okay? And actually, the answer is pretty subtle. Grad using the gradients doesn't always make things better. But how can I optimize without gradients, right? There's a bunch of different ways people do this, okay? There's a whole, um, there's actually a great tool called Nevergrad, a, a great Python toolbox. Um, It has a whole zoo of black box optimizers that take problems in this form and will, will find their way down there. But conceptually, how would you do that, right? So 
if you, for instance, started taking, you have this as your initial guess. Well, the reasonable thing to do would be to take a couple other sample points. The simplest version, of course, would be sample everywhere and find your, and just take the smallest value. But that's not going to work in very high dimensional spaces. You can't sample everywhere in a, in a high dimensional space. So what you tend to do is you sample locally in your high dimensional space and use that to make an estimate of the gradient and then move down the, the gradient. Or you can do an estimate of the second order curvature and try to do a second order method. Every one of those uh, sort of, every version of those exists and they all have a name. The, the one that sort of makes the second order, that's kind of a sample based version of SQP, you might think of that as covariance matrix adaptation, for instance. Okay, but RL tends to be doing first order method, you know, sorry, zero order optimization based on gradients, okay? So it's not trying to estimate directly the second order moments. So how would I do that? Okay, this is what we're gonna have you look at a little bit more carefully in your PSAT, let's get started. The simplest algorithm that you could imagine is something, I like to think about it as, uh, and I learned it from my advisor to think about it as uh, the simplest form of RL would be something like weight perturbation, okay? So here's an idea. Okay, so imagine I'm going to evaluate F twice. Okay, I'll evaluate it F at alpha, and then I'll evaluate it again at alpha plus some small random noise here. It turns out that using only those two samples, you can actually get a pretty reasonable sort of, um, at least in theory, that the expected value of an update that looks like this, okay, if I, if I were to make an update, let's say I'm gonna update alpha to be just some learning rate, this is my learning rate, just like in gradient descent, times f of alpha plus w minus f of alpha, and I multiply that by w. And let's just read this off, what's, what's, what's happening, okay? So I have some initial guess alpha. I'm gonna evaluate it at that guess. I'm gonna evaluate it at some other random um, point nearby that guess, okay? If the reward if f of this is higher than this, then I'm gonna try to say, I'm gonna say the gradient is with respect to, I should move in the direction of w. I guess I, uh, if I'm doing, uh, minimizing the function, I wanna go, if I do the gradient de descent, I'm going down. If I'm trying to maximize my reward, I can go up, okay? But basically, if my change got better, then I know that the, the score is going up in the direction of w. If the change got worse, then I should actually go in the opposite direction. Here's the some maybe surprising thing. It's not surprising, um, I guess, but what you can say about this update is that the expected value of that update is proportional to the true gradient, right? What's that? You want me to be dividing this by W? So it would look more like, um, it's, it, it has to be times W. So I mean, this is a vector, right? I want alpha to be the same size as vector, as that vector, yeah? You're thinking of finite differences, probably, where you would divide that by the magnitude of W on the bottom, right? Yeah, but this is actually a slightly different update, and that's, this is the one we're talking about in RL, okay? 
So just saying I'm going to make a random change and I'm going to go in the direction of that change based on the, the difference it makes in my cost is enough to say I've made an update which on average goes down the policy gradient or up depending on if I'm doing minimization or maximization. I did write min there so I'm going to keep a min here and stay consistent here. Okay. So this update alone will give you this picture like this. Okay. If I have some optimization landscape, gradient descent will go straight down to the bottom. Right? This is a stochastic gradient descent. It'll, it'll walk around, okay, but it'll find its way down to the minimum. This is, the, uh, this is a, a low performing version of it, okay? but this is sort of the mental model that you might want to have in your head when you're thinking about how RL is doing optimization. It's going to take many more steps to get to the, mo to, to the bottom, okay? But it's immune to, ne you don't need the gradient directly. You can just sample these things. You could do it on a uh, the game of Go. You can do it on uh, proteins or whatever. You can do it on robots. Okay, the, the steps that go from this super simple algorithm uh, to the ones like PPO are, are finite, but they're essential. Okay, so the first thing is that the efficiency of this algorithm is very low, which you can you can ask what's the variance of the estimator, okay? And it's actually going to be a it's going to be a very high uh, variance estimate. So even though in, on average it's going to go downhill the policy gradient, uh, every one step might be uh, might be bad. You might go uphill before you go down downhill and, and things like this. Okay, if you're in a very rocky part of the landscape, then going in a direction you didn't sample from could be a bad idea. Okay, so the name of the game here is actually to uh, reduce the variance of the of the gradient estimator. <coughs> one way to do that in the RL context, one way to do that is to um, change the place where you're doing sampling, okay? So <clears throat> um, I'm going to save this uh, in pictures now, and I'll say it in equations on, on Tuesday, okay? So if I have in the middle of my... Um, my feedback loop here, my plant. Okay, I have these parameters alpha. Changing, adding noise to alpha has a variance that scales with the, the number of parameters in your neural network. And we like big neural networks, so that's a bad idea, okay? If you instead say, I'm going to add noise to the output. So if you instead were to say, I'm going to take the policy, let's say, yn, un minus 1, okay, and add noise to it. This is sort of you add noise to the policy output. Then you get a different class of updates. Okay. In the first case, the, uh, the, the variance grows with the number of outputs, plus you have to add a different noise on every step. So now the variance grows. with number of outputs times number of time steps. In most cases, you can win by adding noise to the output of the policy. Okay? And then you can actually use backprop in the, in the neural network to back that change back and have effectively the same sort of update happen on the parameters alpha in order to make the output more likely. Okay, so 
when Peter, when you asked earlier about is the, should this be a stochastic policy, right? This is the reason why oftentimes we like to think about stochastic policies and policy gradient is because <coughs> uh, it can actually reduce the variance of the, of the gradient estimator and allow us to use backprop for the neural net. The derivation is actually beautiful, and so I'll do it, I'll do it next time. The derivation is beautiful, but um, it, it uses exactly the gradients that we have of the neural network and assumes nothing about the gradients of the plant, which we don't have, and it gives you a lower variance update. And that's the policy gradient part of sort of the PPO. It's, it's a, 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 the simplest version of the PPO-like update, uh, and we'll do the rest of it next time. Okay, good.